uh, compliance and enforcement subcommittee meeting to order. Uh, I'll just take a quick roll based on what I see. Uh, we have President Ashley Reynolds, Carrie Jaguer, um, Jim Pepper, Mark Gorman, myself. Looks like Tim Wessel is now just joining us. Yes, sorry about No problem, no problem. Um, we also have Jen Flanagan joining us, Ashley Manning, and Jim Pepper, is there anything else? We got uh, Julie is uh, Julie's here, Julie Holder, and um, we've got just a handful of people uh, from the public as well as um, one representative from uh, Department of Labor Control. Great, thank you. So, uh, what we're going to do? I, I, I know Kyle is, is our our fearless leader is traveling today, uh, but based on the agenda and the PowerPoint that was disseminated. Um, I wanted to provide the, the summary for our author cultivation security um, and it bleeds a little bit into, into more retail, but, but Jen's mostly going to handle that, that portion today. Uh, but I wanted to have Mark go through that. I know Kyle said he wanted to summary from us to just present some options um, for everyone to take a clean look at. So Mark, do you know how to do all the tech to be able to share? <laughs> you mean put the slide? Put the, put the slide. To the presentation. Yeah. Um, I'm doing it. Huh? I, I did. I'm putting it up. I oh, learned yeah. last week uh, well, on Monday what this was activity mostly. That's what I'm doing now. <laughs> Some uh, seem to be some agreement among the subcommittee members that if you uh, you were out of sight of public property or public roads, that uh, perhaps fences wouldn't be uh, nearly as important. Uh, so we started talking about it, and then Kyle asked for some some alternatives: fences or no fences, or instead of fences, maybe a, a video surveillance. Since that's not cheap either, probably, uh, rather than 
video surveillance, how about other other types of uh, security like uh, motion activated lights and alarms and, and so forth. Uh, and rather than rather than um, electronic systems, how about if your your crops were out of uh, you know outside the the view of uh, of the public? And I think uh, uh, Ashley had brought that up, and um, you know that's maybe maybe that's you know good enough. Um, and then uh, others, uh, I think maybe Carrie might have been one, brought up the, the notion that uh, your ca cannabis crop is in greatest danger of threat theft during the last three weeks prior to harvesting. So, uh, you know, maybe there would be temporary um, security solutions that uh, are even less costly. Uh, and uh, if those are worth, those are worth. Uh, Exploring. So, since we talked about this quite a bit, and since we wanted to uh, focus down on uh, you know, the small cultivators and uh, in, in, a, in a more general way, and then and then move on to indoor security and, and retail security, I think I'll let you take these slides home with you, or unless you have you've seen them and you want to, don't want you want to, you know, to uh, to comment on them here. Um, Gina, do you, uh, I know you were talking about uh, understanding uh, the home grow and, and so forth that, uh, you know, probably has the least level of security requirements and uh, kind of building from there. Yeah, so um, I'm not, it just to take into consideration of time, I've added the homegrown slides, the medicinal, and the hemp program slides um, for you that everyone should have received yesterday, just sort of to understand what is happening in sort of different areas and also batch level. Now, we've, um, the data that we've received from the Department of Agriculture is really saying that theft has really drastically decreased to almost none um, since homegrown was available. So it, um, unless you have any questions, I'm going to start with small cultivators. Any questions before we move on? From okay, great. Um, I know we're always saying, you know, how can we let put a less burden on small cultivators of a thousand square feet? And with speaking with Carrie and David, you know, they've given us a lot of information about, you know, they feel that there needs to be the least restrictive of security guidelines on this. Um, if someone could adhere to a block view access. I um, can't see this from the street, people don't know it's there. You know, oftentimes it is safeguarded by just where it is, you know, um, back in a house, um, back of the dwelling, no one can see it. You have permanent limited land access. Um, and oftentimes because of the liberal firearm laws, a lot of people already know you probably have a firearm there, so you would assume that it's secure. Um, also, outdoor um, cannabis um, appears to be less sought after than um, indoor, just because of it not being as rich as an indoor plant would be. And due to the size of the crop, an owner would really be able to see all four corners relatively easy and with the visual eye. Um, but they do agree during the last three weeks, this is the most important time when these plants are becoming mature and have a high THC level in it. Uh, so we just wanna make you aware of those so when we make these recommendations today, you're understanding why some things might be in view of a small cultivator versus the three to 6,000 square feet might need more security. So our first recommendation is to have the eight foot high chain link fences, gates with security locks, video surveillance systems um, for over keeping that footage for 90 days, having an alarm system, motion activated floodlights at each access point, um, and timely reporting of thefts and or losses to regulatory authorities. This is like 
the maximum security uh, um, that someone should have. This is recommendation one, saying that and no matter what tier level you are, you should be adhering to this. Now, the second recommendation with some people saying, do we really need fences, do we really not need fences, is to say that if we can see you from the public area or from any other building, then you do not need a fence. But you still need a video surveillance system, an alarm system, floodlights, um, and obviously timely reporting of any thefts that may occur. After speaking with the they recommended having seven security recommendations. So on the right hand side of the slide, you'll see what those are, and that we separate this into different tier groups because the same security is not needed for a thousand square foot versus a three thousand square foot versus six thousand. So at the thousand square foot, one, you needed to choose one of these security measures. At 3,000 square foot, you needed to have fencing because of the large um, space. Every, you're not able to see every single point of your crop just by looking at it. Um, so fencing is, uh, is necessary. And also at 6,000 square foot as well, you need fencing. At 3,000, you choose two of these security recommendations, and at three, um, at 6,000, you need three along with the fencing. The thousand square foot cultivator could choose fencing, and then they would need no other requirement if that's what they so choose. So, seven security recommendations were video, uh, video surveillance systems, alarm systems, a photographic surveillance system that constantly is taking photographs, a motion-activated floodlight, and they wanted to include to make sure that you're allowed to face it away from um, some aspects of the plant so that you're not constantly being turned on um, by different animals and affecting um, the growth of a plant. Um, security s services, um, which means someone being present there or hiring a third party to have a physical presence. Motion censored trail cameras, or at seven, a control point of access. Along with this, during the last three weeks, that there needed to be 24 hour attendance over the plant, regardless of your tier level, timely reporting of all your thefts. Um, and we really wanted to point out the reason for the three weeks before harvest is that THC is at its peak and it's the highest risk for death. Um, if your crop is visible from the street, a physical barrier of concealment must be created, fencing, hedge, a barn. Um, if the facility experienced enough um, a theft, you would need to include another a level of security, so you would need to add on another security measure. Um, and I think it's important for whatever recommendation is made that before a license is granted, that the, an inspector comes onto site to make sure about its visibility and its accessibility. And if any additional security measures need to be added, that would be discussed with you and the inspector at that time. And that point of access to the cannabis crop and the GPS location, both is needed during the application process. Um, and then after the first growing season, that security and compliance must be reassessed. Um, so that's part of recommendation three, but I really feel that this last slide is part of all the recommendations. So what is um, people's feelings? Ashley, how do you feel about recommendation one, two, and three? Uh, one, no, not in favor of that. Um, two, mm, not in favor of that one either. Um, I Three, I like um, not any of this. But what you said before about, you can go to that other last um, slide 13. That right there, like this looks sensible to me. 
especially if we're thinking about advocating for the small grower. You know, I know a lot of folks who are already perfectly set up to go just without being in plain sight. Um, they're going to be at their home, so they're going to be growing in the backyard. They're going to be home all the time since they work from home. They'll obviously be home in the evening, and I think that that is a majority of our outdoor growers case. So I'm really concerned about adding all these additional costs in the first year. I think it's also very sensible that we're going to you know, reconvene and follow um, a guideline after the first grow. Um, and then take it from there. But I think if we reduce as little, uh, or reduce as much of the barriers as possible, um, including fencing, I mean, security equipment is so expensive. Um, and we, with um, a friend and colleague of mine who have the company uh, Maine Craft Cannabis, um, a medical cannabis company um, in Portland, Maine, and they specifically offer on the medical side of growing indoors which they have no oversight on, no regulation of any kind, they don't even have to have an alarm system, although their insurance company does require it, that their friends who are on the rec side and growing indoor, that most of them are returning back to the illicit market because the amount of oversight and regulation and cost for uh, photos, for cameras, for lights, for security, and so, Knowing my constituents and my fellow Canvas colleagues, like I really, I really am not in favor of having to do any fencing and definitely not any um, alarms or video equipment. Thank you. Thank you, um, Ashley. Those were really great points that you made. Um, so motion sensor trail cameras are control point of access. And then you mentioned cost. But I feel even for the thousand square foot cultivator, you know, these may be some low, really security risk, especially at night. We don't want someone to feel that they need to be up 24 hours a day. Um, a motion sensor trail camera, you know, can, it is really efficient, but can be, you know, really much lower cost than some of the other things that we're recommending. In your perspective, do you think that, you know, that that is really not a huge burden for a thousand square foot cultivator to, to get? And if you don't know, we can pass that question along to someone else. Uh, I mean, I think my stance is pretty clear. You know, I think we should try it out for a year and reevaluate. If it's just rampant, you know, that's one thing, but I mean, I think all of us as cultivators are, are very aware of the risk. I don't think anyone's not aware of those last two to three weeks. Um, I think many of us are gonna do what we need and feel that we need to do. I just don't think it needs to be required the first year. So what is a security option that you think what would be affordable for a thousand square foot cultivator? Um, out of sight and those last two to three weeks more or less home or more or less in the area um, frequently surveilling themselves. Okay, thank you. And Tim, um, what are your thoughts? Sorry about that. Um, you know, when I saw fencing, the fencing listed and uh, sort of self-guided security cameras and self-guided lighting, lack of a better term. I didn't think that was an unreasonable thing to have in place because, I mean, it, it also, it, it depends on, I don't really know much about the zoning of these areas and, and what, how close to centers of population they can be. Do, do we have that information? No, we're developing those, the buffer zones as well, Tim. Yeah, I mean, you know, because some of it's obviously over overlaps, and uh, so I would ask from like municipalities' perspectives, uh, are local police going to be expected to respond to theft um, calls? And if they are, then why why wouldn't we establish some sort of base level of 
reasonable security that's not too expensive for a cultivator. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, it's just just a free for all, and, and local police are expected to um, find who done it when there's no nothing stopping anybody from walking in and out with plants. So, what is your recommendation for? or outdoor cultivation recommendation one with everything um, recommendation two video surveillance alarms floodlights um, yeah I mean I guess I would or, or recommendation or, three which is you know seeing what best fits where where you're living I mean obviously we can make some um, edits to this depending on you know how close they are to you know a city or you know school zones etc right um, I don't I can't imagine anybody even at the thousand foot level um, having a problem with fencing but um, yeah I mean I think, I think so would, so would you like this right you you like recommendation one? I mean, I think recommendation three is at least acknowledging that there's different situations concerning the different um, uh, size of the cultivation, right? And um, it's a pretty low bar from what I can see. You know, alarm systems, I don't know how effective that would be if it's out away from people, you know. We all know how effective car alarms are, for instance. Um, but, uh, well, especially in cities, you know, you don't think, oh no, cars get into um, But everything else seems pretty reasonable. I, I just don't have enough, you know, experience to, to feel like I stick my feet in the sand for number one. Um, so I would, I would go with the, you know, whatever the consensus is, whether three or two. I sort of like the idea of it being scalable according to the scale of the operation. Okay, thank you. And and Carrie, what are your thoughts? You would think, you would think two years of this and I'm still speaking without taking myself off you. No, we were we were trying to uh, Come up with something that uh, addressed the concerns of the regulators, addressed the concerns of local constituents, as well as law enforcement. Um, you know, I'm interested in hearing what people say. Um, you know, my thoughts were that last slide, like at the end, somebody needs to be on site. Um, so if you're growing near your home, that's easy. If not, you better hire somebody or pitch a tent, pitch your own tent in the field where where it's growing. And I think that's going to be a larger deterrent than, than any of the other um, options. And I, that seemed to be what worked for preventing thefts of, you know, pumpkins, as well as apples and other ag products was having a physical presence on site um, at the time or nearing harvest. Um, and, you know, it's just something to think about. And uh, I'm learning more and more from listening to what other people have to say. Thank you. Uh, just for the record, which is your favorite recommendation? One, two, or three? I do like three because it's scalable and it fits um, what I believe Vermont agriculture or Vermont. The Vermont uh, cannabis community um, can easily sort of meld into, um, and also sort of does put the onus on on the grower to, to decide what level of security they want and they can afford. Um, my thought is, you know, if a grower does experience of theft and does report it, um, then your best management practices are to choose another one or 
of the security methods um, to prevent a future theft. So it's scalable in that manner as well. Thank you, Gary. Ashley, I saw your hand raised. Did you have a comment or question? I just was curious because it looks like two things here of the thousand square foot cultivator may only choose fencing if preferred. Is that like a recommendation within a recommendation? Because then I see at the top it says thousand square foot only choose one. Because I'm with Carrie, like I think like, you know, the tiering system of the larger grows, you know, I could get on board with a 3,000 square foot choosing one, a 6,000 square foot choosing two items. But I really think we should go off of what happens in the first year. And I mean, I, I'm not, the, this is my first time helping write policy, but like, I think anybody who's getting into this knows the risk. I, I would be shocked if they didn't. And like, a, a lot of those items, one through seven for recommended security, like some people are gonna do all of them who have had experiences with theft. Is that gonna be, I'm probably not. And so I just, I think we should try to really leave it up to the farmers knowing what the risk is. Just like, you know, getting into a car and putting your seatbelt on or not. You know, you're assuming the risk. We want you to put your seatbelt on. Does everybody know? But I mean, that's up to the person, it's up to the beholder. And I think we should put more trust into the cultivators and more trust in our community. I mean, this plant has been around it's been accessible. We've talked all about how if anybody wants to get cannabis, they can already. So I, I just don't think that is going to be a huge issue for us. Thanks. Okay, thanks, Ashley. Sure. Just to clarify, this is only there because fencing is not under one of the security recommendations. So someone may just like a fence for their own um, habits. So they can choose fencing that wasn't here. Um, or they can choose one of these. I just think one uh, of these. Out of all three of the recommendations, Ashley, would recommendation three be your favorite out of all three of them? Favorite if we can get rid of that thousand square foot having to do anything. I would rather put the choose one in a three thousand and choose up to two or six thousand. Okay. I do you think that there needs to be a minimum baseline of security. Uh, and I think that's one of the recommendations that are, are being presented. Uh, yes, Carrie, did you say something? I did. Um, and actually, just for clarity, um, if a thousand square feet uh, were to choose one, does the last, does the recommendations for the last three weeks before harvest uh, make sense to you? Absolutely, which we're all gonna do anyway. So what, whether that's recommended or not, that is the norm for that time of year, so yes. And one of the things that we discussed with Gina was having this all out of sight. So if you are in a tighter community, then you do need a fence to keep it out of sight. So it's sort of the attractive nuisance piece we want to prevent. And we talked about if you can do that on your property with natural barriers keeping it out of sight, then you might not need a fence. But if you're in a, in a more densely populated area, how are what, how are you going to keep it out of sight? And our our default was a fence, and that's not the chain link, that's sort of stockade or some other, we just want to keep it out of sight. And yeah, agreed. agreed. I don't know. I think so, about it, LinkedIn, that's going to be trickier than like here in Stowe or Elmore, like it's correct. here. So yeah, I think that's extremely sensible, but I definitely don't want that chain link fence. I think, you know, regular snow fence, um, you know, chicken wire, I've seen the gamut, but um, yeah, I think that's sensible for those in higher populated, more visible off the street areas. So that's why you saw that in, in on the previous slide. Um, we're trying to accommodate out of sight. So if it is a thousand square, and this was sort of a scalable thing that we we're trying to accommodate for. So as long as we can keep it out of sight, whether that's a fence or some other way, 
and I think it is a fence in if these are in uh, dense or populated areas. But uh, you know where I live, where you live, I know. Can I get Tom's um, Tom's hand just raised? Tom. Yeah. Thanks. Um, I, I, I want to offer this perspective, knowing and disclosing full well. This is coming from the NHCB perspective, opposite side of the spectrum from what Ashley is, is suggesting. And I think I intimated this at the last meeting, but um, listen, I, I, I get it. If, if uh, I mean, uh, I'm a lawyer, uh, I have, and, and Chairman Pepper knows this and other attorneys, we have a tremendous amount of ethical rules that, that we have to navigate. It raises the cost. It, it, it makes things, sorry, that's my raw water, uh, just a lot more difficult in general. Um, but they're there in, for, for a reason. Uh, not having fences. Not having a fence is going to be, uh, as I said, a, a radical departure uh, from what the regulations are in, in many, many other states. And uh, the, some of the, so I, I, I just want everyone to know that I know it's it's Vermont and you guys trust each other and it's different there and you want to have that. Uh, but just a, a couple questions that I have. Ashley, I'll let you go as I walk my Rottweiler up, and I'll get to those two questions I have on the uh, assumptions. I, I think to speak to Tim's point about the municipal concerns, and you know, I, I've been hearing a lot of that from from my own local um, select board and planning commissions asking, you know, what should we be looking for? What should we be anticipating for extra need? And you know, to the point of being in areas that are more populated or someplace like Brattleboro, I mean, the town itself can decide what its sort of town requirements are. Is that not true? I thought that's the whole point out of our bill in state that like, you know, we, we make these state guidelines, but towns can certainly say what they want to say, you know, or the community. I mean, you're not going to have people at town meetings saying, I don't, you know, you're going to have plenty of people in town meetings saying, you know, I can see this farm from my house and I don't like that. I can smell this farm from my house and I don't like that. But that's why, what's that, that's what town meeting's for. That's, you know, to bring grievances, not for us to then change complete state policy based off of one town's concern of where someone's growing a plant or not. Well, just a uh, point of um, information. That's not actually how it works in Vermont. Um, the, the state decides what kind of rules the towns can make so um, I'll give you an example, which is actually very apropos of this discussion we're having. Um, it's stunning, but in Vermont and in Brattleboro, uh, if somebody goes into your backyard, which is not fenced, and goes into your car, which is not locked, they are not committing a crime. Did anybody know that? <laughs> so you wouldn't know that. But, but it's literally not in state statute that entering someone's car that is unlocked is a crime. Little loophole that maybe somebody should take care of at some point. Um, but I would imagine that a lack of fencing makes it not a crime to steal cannabis. So I think somebody should check into that. And I think having a base level of security um, might really be a good thing for any kind of cultivator or grower wanting to go into the business. Well, I think indicating that it's private property might do that. But one of the people I would really love to hear from is Jen. I know that you've done this in Massachusetts. Obviously, Vermont is a very different state. How do you feel about recommendation three? And you're on mute. I never hired me for my technological ability. Um, I mean, the, the way that we considered it in Massachusetts was that this plant has a value to it. Um, we have to think of the good and bad. We did require security for everything except home growth because we obviously can't tell someone what to do with their home. Um, and so for me, having a base level of security was important. 
um, give a message that is very different. I mean, you have a very different, you know, way of thinking or way of doing things up in Vermont that I would, I would guess that recommendation three might be more palatable to people. I have to think that as business owners, they're going to want to protect their product because that's how they're going to make their money. So the business owners are going to want to do something to protect that. Um, but when we were doing this in Massachusetts, we wanted security and, and that was part of it. And that's why fencing was the basic level of security that was required. Out of the seven security recommendations, I would be um, assuming, you know, sort of motion sensor trail cameras or, you know, activated floodlights, um, uh, censoring. Do you think that that is enough of a basic level of protection for the, for the state of Vermont? I couldn't say. I mean, I think that motion sensor lights is a, is a deterrent for theft in general. I don't think it's specific to cannabis. Um, you know, you try to go somewhere and commit a crime, someone's light comes on and you're sort of deterred from that. Uh, but I really think that the commissioners, see the, the other piece of this too is that the commissioners are going to have to decide what what's going to be required at the enforcement level. So when your inspectors go out and inspect, should you have inspectors that are inspecting properties, is this going to be part of the package that they're inspecting that you actually have something? Um, so I think the commissioners have to think of this at a, at a higher level than maybe what the subcommittee members are looking at it from. Um, you know, and I do agree with Mr. Wessel, if there's going to be thefts, then the cost is going to come to the town. And so you you may have additional police activity. You don't know that yet because, because it's not there. Well, thank you, Jen, for, um, for that information. I think it's really helpful. And just from a timing perspective, we really need to just keep this table tabled and, and move on to a different topic. I'm going to hand this back to, to Pepper. <laughs> yeah, thank you for the conversation. I mean, uh, these are uh, really important, really important input for the board to hear. Um, I'm not going to weigh in because uh, we will have this debate at some point as a board. But um, I, Tim, um, Kyle mentioned to me that you might have a specific update uh, for the for the um, for this subcommittee, and I wanted to just offer you space to, to talk about that. I don't know if that's true or not. I haven't. Kyle didn't tell me what it was about. But lo local issues, local. No. Oh, uh, uh, yes, but um, I was actually going to send it out in sort of a just an email blast. Okay. Um, sure. My perspective before. Well, probably well, definitely before Wednesday. Okay. Um, I appreciate that. And I think I was going to get something to Julie, too. I don't know if she's there, uh, which is kind of describing that idea that I mentioned in a meeting about setting, speaking of tiers, setting tiers for municipalities just to make it clear what kinds of municipalities we have in Vermont. So I was, I came up with a, along with BLCT, came up with a four tier um, system. So I'm going to forward that to Julie as well. Okay, great. All right, yeah, that is just, uh, that's great. Well, um, I mean, I think that this is a really important conversation around outdoor security. I know that uh, the members of the room, the members of the public here today care deeply about it. And I know that, um, you know, every cultivator cares deeply about what's gonna be required of them and what cost it's gonna be. Um, I'm looking at the time. It looks like we have about eight minutes before public comment. Um, Tom, I think um, for, Jen, I think there was going to be a conversation about indoor security today. Is that, do you think eight minutes can do it? At least get the ball Easily. rolling? Yep. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I've been asked to talk about what we did in Massachusetts again um, with regard to indoor security. And I, I have to say that at a base level, Massachusetts has general marijuana establishment security levels. And so there's a basic premise that you have to keep the product safe, you have to keep the employees safe, you have to keep the facility safe. There are some instances when it comes to indoor facilities that there's a little bit of enhancement to that. Um, you have to prevent loitering and ensure that only the individuals that are actually conducting business are there and that they're there for the amount of time that they're gonna conduct their business. 
Um, you have to secure all the entrances to the facility. You've got to store the finished product in a secure, uh, safe that um, that in a way that prevents diversion and theft, and that is only accessible to certain people. Um, and you have to ensure that the outdoor perimeter of the establishment is sufficiently lit, sufficiently lit um, for. And so, you know, other than those types of things, you know, you have to have the alarm systems. You have to have um, um, limited access areas. You have to make sure that nobody can see it from the outside of the building or from the street level. Uh, none of those things are really different when it comes to indoor facilities in Massachusetts. Uh, and I think, you know, one of the things that we really wanted to do um, was provide consistency. So we didn't want to say, okay, if you have an outdoor facility, you have to do X. If you have an indoor facility, you have to do Y. And so in our regulations, um, which is 935 CMR 500.110, they are the safety requirements for marijuana establishments in general. And then subsequent to that, you may have a little more for the outdoor and then a couple different ones for the indoor. Um, the one thing about the indoor too is that we uh, made sure that you have sort of um, duress alarms. So you have panic <coughs> buttons and those panic buttons, buttons will go to the local public safety. So it'll go right to your police department or at the closest law enforcement authority. Um, you know, we don't have sheriffs that patrol down Massachusetts. It's our police and state police. So the alarm would go straight to them and that would um, indicate that there's a problem. And again, you have to think about it. It's to keep the employees safe, the product safe, and the building safe. And so um, we felt that taking those general steps would allow people to do that. I mean, I can take any questions that people have or sort of explain why we did what we did. Jen, I, I would say my question, which is always my question, is is there a rationale for waiving some of the security requirements for 1,000 square foot indoor cultivation? There can be a rationale. I mean, if you have basic uh, security systems that people can't get in the building and you're not there, then I, I would assume that there is. We also have in our rights that if you want an alternative, you better provide the alternative, and then it, you can request that that be approved. So we give people the ability, because quite frankly, we were five people, right, who, had, who got into this and were appointed and had to do this in a short amount of time. We know there are security experts out there that might know a different way to do it and that want to do a different in a different way, or maybe you have um, an MSO who comes in and has been doing a certain way in a different state and it works for them. So we have the ability that, um, to ask for a different type of security system that meets the standards. So when we were doing, when we were conduct, creating the licensing process, we knew that from micro grows up to the 100,000 square foot, there were going to be differences and that's why we allotted for the request to change. Hey, um, Jen. Mark Gorman, uh, I should maybe know a little bit more about this, and I'm going to go look it up. But uh, is uh, our rules for liquor stores and microbreweries and you know uh, micro distillers comparable, or is there some kind of feeling on the part of uh, the public that you know this is new, this is scary, and we've got to really uh, you know, turn these things into, you know, Fort Knox. I don't think either. Uh, quite frankly, the public does, didn't get a ton of um, public comment when it came to us creating the first set of regs. We literally had two and a half months to do it. So, you know, the, the way I saw it, the public could obviously email us at any point in time. It didn't have to be formal public comment periods. But the, what we were considering is the fact that this was going to be a newly regulated product. This was federally illegal, and so we had all the obstacles that we, that alcohol doesn't have the benefit of. We didn't have the federal government coming in with any type of money, any type of services, any type of everything. Personally, I didn't compare it to alcohol. I, I, this was something that we knew that we were charged with doing. Um, and again, I want to remind you that 
we had a U.S. Attorney General here in Massachusetts that was saying we're going after everybody if somebody screws up. You know, that was the sentiment back then. We were going after the lead tenders, we were going after the growers, we were going after everyone. Um, and so we, as a commission, decided there was going to be a baseline set of security in place standards, and that if you wanted to change that, you had the option to ask the commission. The other thing, too, was we weren't sure in the beginning how many enforcement inspectors we had. So we didn't know where these guys were going to have to travel or how far away they were going to have to travel, because originally our office was sited in downtown Boston, and I was thinking of the Berkshires. I ended up in the Berkshires and back. And then once we got to Worcester and we got some more personnel, it just, it, it just became second nature. Um, so there really wasn't a comparison to alcohol. There really wasn't a comparison to micro brews or breweries or any of that. It was, this is our charge. This is what the landscape is in the United States right now. We knew we were the first on the East Coast, so we really tried to pay attention to the fact that New England was sort of clustered together. And, um, that's why you see residency requirements for our micro grows, is because we didn't want people jumping the borders to come in and start businesses and then go home. Because uh, we felt the people of Massachusetts voted on this initiative for the people of Massachusetts. We, we were doing the opposite. I think of what Vermont was doing. We weren't welcoming everybody into the state. Um, so some some of this could could change as, as uh, legalization changes. You have com you have commissioners that have term limits, so anything is possible. Um, I know that the commission's not going to do the regulatory change they talked about, so that's going to be another year out if anything changes. I will say in the two subsequent right changes that we had, we, this didn't come up. We, we didn't change it at all. But it wasn't a public sentiment that this is scary, this is, it has to be locked up, it has to be Fort Knox. This was five commissioners saying, this is what we want to see our state look like. Which I know is very different from the sentiment in Vermont. Ashley, can I ask you a question? Oh, sorry, Tim, go ahead. If you don't mind, just really quickly on the one point you made um, about the um, alarms that go back to police departments, and I'm sure you all know what I'm going to say. So that's uh, that's time and money and taxpayer money on a local level. And as of yet, we have no support from the state of Vermont coming to us through taxes and fees. Um, meanwhile, Massachusetts uh, local governments can excise tax up to 3% on the sales. Um, Only for dispensaries, town dispensaries. So if you're a town that has just cultivation, you don't get that 3%. Okay, that's a fair thing. But also, uh, doesn't Massachusetts also have state revenues that fund public safety and municipal police training? That's what I've noted in my notes. So the municipal police training fund, some of that funding comes from the marijuana trust fund. And so as tax dollars are put into that, the legislature has to take those monies out and put them, them towards training. Uh, when we began, uh, we had, I think I've said this in different subcommittees, we needed three rounds of supplemental funding to get going. The commission didn't have, have the amount of funding that we needed to start. We weren't staffed the way Vermont is staffed when we started. Um, and so, and we didn't have the benefit of having consultants with us along the way. It was literally five people in five cubicles putting pen to paper. Uh, but you're right, we do have state funding for our training, municipal training, state training. Um, I don't believe there has been a large number of those panic buttons used. I think it's just, if it's, if it's the last resort, that's what's going to happen. Uh, but, but you're right. And I think part of it was, the other thing to mention is that under the way that licensing happens in Massachusetts, anyone who enters, who wants to cite a cannabis establishment in a city or town, it doesn't matter what type of establishment or what city or town, you have to enter in what's called a house community agreement. So the controversial, it's controversial as the HCAs that have to be entered into between the city or town and the entity trying to open. And under that, they're allotted up to 3% uh, each year for impacts to be in the town. Now, as a former senator in a sort of rural suburban area, my question was, does your paving schedule have to be exited because now you have more cars on a specific road? 
you know, is there a, a stressor on public safety services if people are calling 911 because they're using it and they weren't educated and they're, they're nervous. Just the typical thing that cities and towns have to account for. Um, but now what it has to happen is the city and town has to prove that that happened and what the money was used for. So there's really a tracking system to that. Sure. And I think the situation we're currently looking at is everything forward as planned is that municipalities in Vermont have no such Exactly. Thanks. I had a question for Ashley, but I don't want to take away from your time, Ashley, if you have questions for anyone else, or for Jen or for anyone. Uh, well, I want to be conscious of public comment too, but I just wanted to ask Jennifer, she doesn't have, they don't have a residency requirement in Massachusetts and how many times you guys have been sued because you, you do have residency requirements. The residency is only for the micros, and okay. so it's only for the really little guys, and I don't think we've been sued at all. <laughs> and, and the whole intent was we had we had farmers, but not like the farmers in Vermont, saying, I just want a plot of land. I just want a small plot of land. They didn't want the big grow facilities. And so the way that we said that was, okay, so we'll say you have to have a residency requirement for the micro grows, but anything above that. So, the, you know, the, the 2,500 to 5,000 square foot, you don't, and I really don't think anyone has sued us for that yet. Yeah, yeah. Did you have a question for me specifically? Yeah, does, um, does your insurance policy for Elmore Mountain Therapeutics require minimum security standards? Yes, but the products itself are not part of the policy. So if somebody breaks in, <laughs> that's not insured, just the actual facility itself and the people in it. All right, great. Um, I will say, has an, I'm the only person who has set up my alarm. I also wanted to make note just on this line, as far as how the chain of command happens when our alarm does go off, we're notified before the police also, and this is our situation, but because we live so close, if the alarm is triggered, we come here first. We don't call, like, we don't tell them to call the police first. If it's something that we can mediate ourselves, we do. If someone's in our facility, obviously, you know, there would be some work to be had there, but cops are not the first, or not the second or the first thing that are called when our alarm does go off. And I think in mass, the duress alarm is like the last. I mean, you have to be in a pretty sketchy situation to, to, to set that off. There's a protocol for it. If, if, the, if the box alarm goes off or if something alarm goes off, then the business has to address it and they have to respond. But if you're in a situation where maybe they're getting robbed or maybe there's someone who feels very threatened by what happened, then that's the last resort. So there's a big protocol before you're setting off the duress club. And also, Pepper, I just wanted to put on the record our products are insured, which is not under the same insurance policy that is our building policy. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank that. you for everybody, yeah. just clarify, we do have product liability yeah. as well. Um, well, there's uh, one member of the public that would like to make a public comment today. Um, so if there's nothing else, we can shift to that. Okay. Slide over there. Hey there, my name is uh, Taylor Carpenter. I'm from Gaston Weed Company. Um, so I just wanted to talk about, or just my opinion about the fencing um, on the outdoor cultivation. And I just think that it, it should definitely be a requirement for all. Um, I think that it's, you know, even a thousand feet, you know, you're talking upwards of a hundred pounds during harvest. and. You know, at two thousand a pound, that's over two hundred thousand dollars, and so I think on such a small area, and I think another really like you know good purpose that can serve is, is there's going to be so many of these thousand foot cultivation licenses, as I'm kind of aware of, and I think it could be really challenging to regulate it and how it you know regulate the whole thing and whether people are splitting up you know five hundred feet over there or over there and it's kind of like that kind of reminds you a lot of like an illicit grow and I think the fencing would really give you like a, a really easy way to you know regulate it of hey thousand foot fencing here it is you can do what you want in there because I think that 
I think measuring a thousand feet outdoor too, it's like, what are you measuring by? You know, you're measuring by the root, you're measuring where the leaves come out to. So I think the fencing could serve a, a lot of a lot of you know positive towards the regulatory um, things. And then I just want to add that I, I think that you know during those three slides of that, I think maybe of like doing recommendation three, but making the fencing requirement for all. So having to add maybe one more. because um, I do think that a you know, a 10,000 square foot outdoor uh, cultivation should not have the, you know, same exact thing as a thousand. But I just wanted to say I think fencing would be, you know, really a necessity in this. So uh, thank you and I uh, appreciate your time. Uh, that's it for public comment, unless anyone has changed their mind. No? So I, I think uh, I think from my perspective, we're ready to adjourn. Is that all right? Okay. Well, I've been advised. Well, Gary, were you about to chime in there? I was going to offer you a motion to adjourn. Second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Get a good of this. Yep. Thank you all. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, Jeff.